Greetings and uh, glad to be with you all again. I want to, this is a greeting for all our brothers and sisters, um, affiliated with the ministry of the, of Sister Grace Zuso and her husband and all the work that you guys do in South Africa and beyond. And we are praising God for you as we present this message, um, that we're going to get right into. I pray everyone is doing well. I'm going to start by reading our scripture reading in Malachi chapter three, starting at verse 17. The Bible says, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. They, then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Our message for this presentation is entitled, The Sower, Present Truth of the wheat and tear, present truth of the wheat and tear. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your grace. Once again, Lord, I just ask that you make me a nail upon the wall, Lord, a rusty, sorry nail. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen nor heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, so we're going to get jump right into this parable. And um, this is part of a larger series that I'll be doing um, on, on the agrarian parables, uh, predominantly with a sower in the story um, that we'll be presenting. And so for our brothers and sisters in South Africa and the Caribbean that we're recording this for, um, just know that there will be more down the road that we'll be able to put together. But for now, we want to jump to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and start at verse 24. The Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tears? And so this is the story of a sower who goes out. This is a landowner. And we know from the other parables who the sower represents. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, and he sows good seed in his field. And one of the things that's important is if you look at the first verse of it, it says, um, the parable starts with the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So the parable is about the kingdom of God. It's talking about God's people. Number one. Number two, it talks about the fact that good seed is sown. And then it says in verse 25, but while men slept, and I want to submit to you that there are that there's a recurring theme in the parables around sleeping. And if you think of the parable of the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, the fact that they all slept. It is while we sleep spiritually that the devil does his work. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didn't we sow good seed in your field? Where did the tear come from? Now, I want to show you, do some botanical studies here. This is a picture of the difference between wheat and tear. Before the wheat ripens, it looks like um, the picture on the left. And you can see that when you look at that one and you look at the one on the right, um, which is the Latin term for tears, is lolium temelentum. And so you can see that there's a big difference, not, not a big difference, as they're growing. The other thing to remember is, not only do they do grow up out of the ground and look just alike, they grow uh, uh, as they grow up, but as their roots go down in the field, the roots would intertwine as they grow together. Right? So here, let's give you, let's give a plant biology, which was, I always say this, but it was my least favorite class in college. Um, so let me show you a little bit about this. The other name for tear is, a, is Darnell, the Lolium telementum. Darnell. So, wheat's evil twin has been intoxicating humans for centuries. Now listen to what it says. Darnell is poisonous, but in small enough doses can give food a special kick. Listen to the description of what the tear, 
uh, specifically the C, but what the tear does. So this article on it says, Darnell occupies a gray area in human agricultural history. It's definitely not good for us. When people eat its seed, they get dizzy, off balance, and nauseous, and its official name, El Temelentum, comes from a Latin word for drunk. Ah, so the wheat are represented as of growing up fully, and eventually they will bear fruit. The tear is represented as a plant that um, historically is seen to make men intoxicated. Wow. As we decipher out this parable, I want you to know that you are called to be wheat and the wheat represents sobriety in its natural form. Now, obviously you can take it and ferment it in its natural form. It bears fruit, but the tear are inherently intoxicating. The Bible calls the Christian to be sober. And we are living in a time when sobriety is being pushed to the outskirts. Not only is uh, in America here, every third or fourth commercial, it seems, is about alcohol. We have legalized marijuana in much of the United States. Uh, and of course, there are many other intoxicating medications and street drugs. Fentanyl uh, uh, is killing Americans by the thousands. In a 12-month period going uh, over the last uh, couple of years, but in one 12-month stretch, there was a time when 100,000 Americans died of drug overdose. The Bible says to be sober, to be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The tear, never forget this, are intoxicating so the wheat nourishes, but the tear intoxicates. All right, what does Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 31 adds to this? If the tear are in the church, as we're going to see they are, Jeremiah 5 starts to tell you what the tear are going to do with the message. Jeremiah 5 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? The prophets prophesy falsely. This is the uh, English standard version of the same verse. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? The tear not only like to preach a watered down soft gospel, that's what they want to hear. And let me say this, the church is being gutted by men who are afraid to stand in the pulpit and preach a thus saith the Lord. It is being ripped apart because there are so many now who are afraid to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unadulterated. They were telling me about one of our largest Adventist churches here in North America and how the pastor, we we're talking to someone at a recent Adventist conference, how the pastor of this large church uh, associated with one of our institutions said he will not preach any of our defining doctrines because he does not want the people who listen to his ministry who are not Adventists to ever be offended. But did Jesus ever preach and folk get offended? Did, people, did Jesus not preach the straight truth? Did he not tell the woman caught in the act of adultery, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more? He didn't say, listen, I don't condemn you. I love you. Go and do whatever you want. But that's the gospel that's being preached. It is the gospel of the tear. But here's another aspect to it. Darnell, the tear, is a mimic weed, neither entirely tame or quite wild, that looks and behaves so much like wheat that it can't live without human assistance. Did you get that? The tear need to be taken care of. Darnell seeds are stowaways. The plant's survival strategy requires its seeds to be harvested along with those of domesticated grasses, stored and replanted next season. So the wheat, the, 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 the tear have to go where the wheat are or it will not survive. Oh, y'all missing this thing. In other words, the church is going to be filled with tear because there are folk who want the social atmosphere of the church. They want the nurturing the church gives. They want the friendships. They want the potlucks, but they don't want the gospel. They need to be 
uh, propped up. They need to be taken care of. They want a circle of friends, but they don't want the truth. They don't want to change. They don't want to repent. They don't want character development. The tear need the same treatment as does the wheat, which means the tear are drawn to the church, but they're not changed by the experience of knowing Christ of the church. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 28. The sower says unto them, he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, will thou that we, that, that then that we go and gather them up? He says, a, a, an enemy has done this. The servants look at the master and says, listen, shouldn't we go and pluck the tear up, gather them up and get them out of the way? He says, the master says in verse 29, the sower says, nay, lest while ye gather up tears, you root up also the wheat with them. Remember that it's not just that they look alike above the ground, under the ground, the roots get entangled. Even if you could precisely pick out the tear, which is very difficult to do, you would pull up the wheat in the process. But the problem is you'd be pulling up wheat prematurely. In other words, before they've had a chance to ripen and bear fruit. So what is the Jesus, the, the sower who represents Jesus? What do he say? Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them. I'm going to show you what that means prophetically, because this is present truth you're listening to. Bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So this is speaking of something very specific. So, the disciples hear this, this parable. This happens all the time with the disciples as you read the parables. They don't understand what's going on, right? So they, they, they're they completely confused. They heard the parable of the wheat and tear, trying to figure out what does this mean because they don't understand. Remember, they still think that Israel is infallible, that Israel is a nation that is going to be saved in whole, that, that they're trying to find a way to get Jesus to actually come in and be... Um, 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 the, uh, take this throne of David and, 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 and fix everything. So hearing that there's these two types of people in the field worries them, the wheat and the tear. So they don't understand it. So they come to Jesus. They say, um, when Jesus had sent the multitude away, Matthew 13 and verse 36, then said, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tears of the fields. So the disciples say, listen, help us. Help us figure this out. Look at Christ Object Lessons, page 71. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. Very important point. If you are out there, if there's a man in the church and he's you know fooling around with a whole bunch of women, and this whole thing comes out, there is there have to it is a public sin that we are instructed in the church manual and in the scripture and in the spirit of prophecy that, it, that there should be a, a public um, dealing with that sin. That it, some might have to be put out if they can't get their act together. So Ellen White confirms that. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. Key word there is persist. If someone falls, we're to help them back, try and hold them together. But if they persist in open sin, they must be separated from the church. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. Ah, did you get that? He didn't give us the job of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Ah, if we tried to figure out who in the church are wheat and tear, our judgment is so pure, or so 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 poor that we would literally uproot wheat and leave tear. She says, and this is this is powerful. Many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting, like the five foolish virgins. Many will be in heaven who their neighbor supposed would never enter there. There are people who you look at and say, that guy will never make it into the kingdom. He's never going to learn his lesson. He's never going to be saved. And yet, they might make it into the kingdom before some of us do. Here's what she says. Man judges from appearance. But God judges the heart. The tears and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And here comes the prophecy part. 
and the harvest is the end of probationary time. When probation closes, a harvest will happen, and even then, it will not be the people in the church doing it. Now, there are some offshoots from Adventism that try and teach that, you know, they're going to go in there and they're going to they're gonna sort out who's who. That is not biblical, not in the spirit of prophecy. The harvest is the end of the probationary period when Jesus is no longer mediating for man in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, when he has declared that it is finished, at that point, it will be clear who's who. Matthew 13 and verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Here, he starts to break it down. Who is the, who is the sower? It's Christ himself. Why? Because in that time, one of the most dangerous things you could be is a farmer. You had to leave from behind the gated walls of the city to come out in the field where you are vulnerable to attacks from uh, vagabonds and mercenaries and marauders and all kinds of stuff, wild animals. You had to come out. The sower represents Christ because Christ left from behind the beautiful gated walls of the heavenly realm. And he came to earth as a baby in a manger, vulnerable to the wiles of Satan and of this sinful world. I, you know, it is said that as Satan saw him in that manger in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes, even Satan himself was in awe that one who once so, was once so high would come so low. Jesus is the sower because he left the place of safety to plant the good seed. And we know from the parable of the, of the soils, uh, we, which we also call the parable of the sower, we know that the seed is the word of God. Ha! So Jesus isn't just the sower, he's the seed. Because the seed is the word of God in the other parable, and that goes back to John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the sower. The word is a seed. And we then, as the, we take the word, we become seed and we are planted in this world. So Matthew 13 and verse 38 says, the field is the world. And so some people, if you listen to some other theologians from outside of our denomination, they will tell you that it is the whole globe. It's the heathen. It's the unsaved and the saved. The church is the, is the good part. It's the, it's the good seed and the, the world are the tares. Let me tell you something. That is not the, that is not what the, the parable is teaching. That is built out of a Christian arrogance. Christ is talking about those who claim to know him. Watch this. Spirit of Prophecy says, Christ Object Lessons, page 70. The field, Christ said, is the world. But we must understand this as signifying the church of Christ in the world. Ha! She makes it very clear. Matthew 13, verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tears are the children of the wicked one. So you get to know who is who. Verse 39, he says... The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So who came while everyone was sleeping and planted tear among the good seed that was planted? In other words, how did the church get in the condition it's in where it has a mixed multitude that will stay mixed until the time when probation closes? It is because while men slept, the devil did this work. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy is. Christ Object Lesson, page 71, she says, in the East, men sometimes took revenge upon an enemy by strewing his newly sown fields with the seeds of some noxious weed that while growing closely resembled wheat. Springing up with the wheat, it injured the crop and brought trouble and loss to the owner of the field. So it is from enmity to Christ that Satan scatters his evil seed among the good grain of the kingdom. Satan, <laughs> don't miss this, especially if you've ever been hurt by church folk, don't miss this. If you've ever been traumatized by church folk, don't miss this. The devil plants bad people in the church for his gain. The devil does it. There are people in church that may not even know it. Some know it, some don't know it, but they are literally practicing spiritual espionage. They are double agents for Satan. 
and they are in the church, but their job here is to harm the work of God. The devil planted them. So yeah, you're going to meet some people in church who aren't going to be very kind. You're going to meet some people in church who aren't very nice. But if you don't understand that their uh, uh, cruelty is not your problem, it is the fact that they are of their father, the devil. They're tear. She says the fruit of his sowing, he attributes to the son of God. Did you get that? He says, I'm, he puts bad people in the church and says, that God brought them into the church. By bringing into the church those who bear Christ's name while they deny his character, the wicked one causes that God shall be dishonored, the work of salvation misrepresented, and souls imperiled. And I've seen it all my life. I, I was talking to a young man who was a former Adventist, said he's a Muslim now, and he was telling me that he left the church, and he's, he's still a young man, he's probably like 30 years old. He said I left. he left the church because the pastor, when he was growing up, did this, this, and that. And there was some scandal with women and da-da-da-da, and he left the church. And I had to tell him uh, the pastor was tear. He was planted there. Because if you put your hope in the people of church, even in the leadership of church, and not in Christ Jesus, you are bound to be disappointed. Because you don't know who the weed is and who the tear are. And let me tell you something. There are times when someone who is going to end up wheat looks a whole lot like tear in their behavior. You see, the devil, the devil is still planting into the church. I recently did um, a, a yoga conference, and so I wanted to show some stuff to you guys about how the devil is planting these seeds into the church. This is from crosswalk.com. This is a Christian publication. And they asked the question, should yoga, should church buildings be used for yoga classes? And Maria Cheshire, who writes the article unequivocally in the article, says, yes, we should do it. We should open our doors, gives reasons for it. You can look up the article for yourself. But what they don't know is that they're bringing in Eastern religion and Eastern thought. Now watch this. The Pew Research Center, excellent for research, says, New Age beliefs are common among both religious and non-religious Americans. I'm going to read you a little bit from the article. Most Americans and adults self-identify as Christians, but many Christians also hold what are sometimes characterized as New Age beliefs. So Christians in America are also holding New Age beliefs, including belief in reincarnation, astrology, uh, psychics, and the presence of spiritual energy in physical objects like mountains or trees. Uh, um, kind of like um, um, Kellogg used to believe, right? Pantheism. Many Americans are religiously unaffiliated, also hold these beliefs. Overall, roughly six in 10 Americans adults accept at least one of these New Age beliefs. Specifically, four in 10 believe in psychics and that spiritual energy can be found in physical object, objects, while somewhat smaller shares believe in reincarnation, 33%. That's one out of three people. And astrology. Almost a third of Americans believe the stars are going to predict your future. That is insane and powerful. We are told in the book of Revelation that there, out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet comes three, come three unclean spirits like frogs. Right? You remember that. We have been told that those three things represent Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. We've always wondered how spiritualism gets such a strong foothold in America, but it has. Look at this. I mean, this shows you. Of the Christians, and you see Protestants, 32% of Protestants believe in a, some form of like pantheism. 38% of Protestants hold, believe in psychics. Psychics, who, if you just listen carefully, most of them, it's such a, a, a charlatan job. They tell you these vague things that, that could apply to anyone or anything, yet people believe it. Then you go over here, 26%, almost more than a quarter of Protestants believe in reincarnation. How can you believe a Protestant, believe in the Bible, and believe in reincarnation at the same time? And a quarter, just about a quarter as well, believes in astrology. What I'm telling you is that the devil is still planting seeds in the church. One of them is spiritualism. And I want to challenge you. We just did, if you want to go online and get, look more into this, there's a program, Yoga Unboxed. Um, and I will make sure to, 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 to put out um, from the conference that we just did on Long Island, um, all of the messages when they're finished and how you can get, uh, I'll, I'll figure out a way to get them out to people. But you've got to see this to understand that we are playing with new age things. I remember being at one of our Adventist institutions 
And for Sabbath, they wanted us to go to the beach and do this Eastern meditation ritual ceremony thing on the Sabbath. The tear have been planted and the philosophy of the tear have been planted in the church. Matthew 13 and verse 39 says this. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the, and the reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the world. So we know that the wheat and tear grow together until, the, now you remember this is prophecy now. The wheat and tear grow together until probation closes. But they are harvested at the end of the world. That means there's a time between when it is revealed who is wheat and who is tear and when Jesus comes back to redeem and, 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 and rescue his, the ones he loves. Don't miss this church. During that period, and I'm, I'm going to do my next huge series here at our church is going to be last day events. It's probably going to take the whole of next year to do. So I'll make sure to send those around to, to Sister Suzo as well. But uh, during that time period, when probation is closed and the wheat and tear, no, and everyone knows who's wheat and who's tear, it will be the tear, the former Christians, if you read the end of Matthew chapter 24, who are going to come most violently against those who have been faithful, the wheat. And there's going to be a period. And the reason that the angels themselves must come as reapers is because while in the time of Jacob's trouble, we are crying out for God, un feeling unworthy Worried for our eternity, God is going to send the greatest reconnaissance team ever assembled in the history of the universe to rescue mankind, to rescue his beloved, to rescue the redeemed. The reapers are the angels. Matthew 24, 31, I just referenced, here it is. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Remember, it also says in Matthew that for the elect's sake, time will be shortened. Why? Because during that period between when probation closes, and you can tell who's who, and the people of God become attacked, and the time when they're rescued, the elect are going to be tried. This is the great tribulation of Daniel 12 and verse 1 and Matthew 24. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's how you know the believer, the Christians that have died, are not already in heaven. Because how could you go and ever be with the Lord if you are already with him? So that doctrine is false and leads to spiritualism as well. But look at how, where, where this thing goes. I love the last verse of 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. This verse is important. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why is that relevant, church? Because during the time of Jacob's trouble, we will be comforted by knowing that the angels are coming to redeem, to reap the wheat to take us home. Yeah, we're going to be agonizing, but we will hold on to the promises of God. We'll comfort one another with the words that we know that our Redeemer lives and that he is sending his angels to come and get us. And we will have to stay faithful for the whole universe to see. And I'm going to jump ahead of myself. But during this time, Satan will come as an angel of light and deceive the world. Receive their worship and praise. And try to break the grip that is upon the, the, the faithful of God, the wheat. The Revelation chapter 7, 1 through 3 tells us the, the, the winds that the four angels hold back will be held back until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. That it will happen. Probation will close. And then the, Satan can impersonate who he wants to impersonate. He will impersonate Christ. But we will not be deceived into following him. We can comfort one another with these words. Matthew 13 and verse 40. As therefore the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The bundling of the tears is represented by the seven last plagues. They will be bound before the second coming during that probationary period. Here's what SDA Bible Commentary says. Bind them in bundles. As noted, 
The work of harvest begins at the close of probationary time. When probation closes, the wrath of God is poured out upon the unrepentant earth. See Revelation 15.1. And the seven last plagues that then fall complete the process of binding the tears into bundles ready to be burned. You'll know who is wheat from who is tear because just like during the time of the Egyptians, the seven last plagues that Moses called down on Egypt did not affect the people of God. Only the Egyptians, the seven last plagues at the end of time will not will not uh, affect the people of God. Only those who have not been sealed with the seal of the living God, but instead receive the mark of the beast. Are you getting it? They will be bound and others will be prepared for destruction because they will be they will be uh, affected by the seven last plagues. Matthew 13 and verse 41, the son of man shall send forth his angels. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yes, they're going to be separated. The wheat and the tear will be separated. It's not your job to separate them. God's going to do it when he returns. And they're going to be bound. Sin will never rise up again, the Bible tells us. In because it will be, and let me tell you something, when the whole universe sees what we go through during the time of Jacob's trouble, and again, I'll expound on this later on in another message. When they see the trials that Satan puts the people of God through at the end of time, how he de tries to deceive them as an angel of light. You remember, Satan came as an angel of light to Jesus in the wilderness of temptation and tried to get him to turn the stone to bread. When Jesus said, responded, it is written, he gave us how we are to respond to Satan when he comes as an angel of light. It is written, Jesus will never feet, will never touch the ground when he comes back the second time. And we'll know all the ways to separate who is who. But the last time Satan came before uh, Jesus in the wilderness of temptation, he came as Satan. Let me tell you something, church. When the universe sees the faithful of God are able to hold out during that time of Jacob's trouble, even when it's all over, even Lucifer, even the fallen angels and the wicked of the world, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That last test of the saints, when they don't fail during the time of Jacob's trouble, will tell the universe that God's character is vindicated. His law is right. But church, you can't get right then. Probation would have been closed. Let me say this to you. If you can't, as Jeremiah says it, if you can't run with the footmen, how will you keep up with the horses? If you can't keep God's Sabbath now, you really think you're going to keep it when there's a Sunday law and you can be put to death for keeping it? Matthew 13 and verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who have ears to hear, let them hear. So they're going to be bound and burned, and that's the only light they're going to give off. But ha, the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The wheat will shine. Christ Object Lesson, page 74. The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity because there are unworthy members in the church, nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. The Redeemer does not want to lose one soul. His experience with Judas is recorded to show his long patience with perverse human nature, and he bids us bear with it as he has borne. He has said that false brethren will be found in the church till the close of time. Notwithstanding Christ's warning, men have sought to uproot the tears, to punish those who are supposed to be evildoers. The church has had recourse to the civil power. In other words, they went and got the civil power to support the work of the church. And what's scary, let me just say this prophetically, let me say this to you as well. Here in America, there are more and more who are asking that we remove the separation of church and state. There was one... Um, I think she's from Arizona. One uh, a representative from Arizona, a politician, who said that the church should the church should be dictating what the government does after Roe v. Wade was overturned in this country. Let me tell you something. When the church goes to the civil powers in order to uh, enforce things, you have to ask yourself which church, which doctrine, which rule is going to be enforced by the government, the secular government. And that's where we're heading, church. 
She says those who differed from the established doctrines have been imprisoned, put to torture and to death at the instigation of men who claim to be acting under the sanction of Christ. Church, this will be repeated during the time of great tribulation. Daniel 12, 1, there was a time of trouble like there had never been a time of trouble. And Michael the archangel, Daniel says, is going to stand up. That represents Jesus taking off his priestly robe and putting on his kingly robe so that he can return to earth because we will be under such duress during that time. She says, it, it, but it is the spirit of Satan, not the spirit of Christ, that inspires such acts. This is Satan's own method of bringing the world under his dominion. God has been misrepresented through the church by this way of dealing with those supposed to be heretics. That is Satan's work, church, not God's work. Now look at the point of the parable from Christ Object Lesson, page 74. Don't miss this. Not judgment and condemnation of others, but humility and distrust of self is the teaching of Christ's parable. Ha! The wheat and tear is not given so that we can sit in church and try and figure out who's wheat and who's tear. Instead, the parable is given so you ask yourself, am I wheat or am I tear? Am I dedicated to the cause of Christ or am I just plain church? Am I needing to be nurtured among the brethren? Do I like what I get here, but don't want to submit my character and my will to that of God's? This trust of self is the teaching of Christ's parable. She says, not all that is sown in the field is good grain. The fact that men are in the church does not Prove them Christians. I hope you got that. The fact that men are in the church does not prove them Christians. She, she says more on it in a minute, but let me, let me jump here. She says, the tears closely resembled the wheat while the blades were green. But when the field was white for the harvest, the worthless weeds bore no likeness to the wheat that bowed under the weight of its full ripe heads. When the time of trouble really hits and probation closes, there's going to be such a stark difference because the fruit that is born is the fruit of the spirit. And you won't, if they don't have the fruit of the spirit, all of them, remember the fruit of the spirit is singular, but the works of the flesh from Ephesians 6, each individual one is enough to cause you to be lost. She says, sinners who make a presentation of piety mingle for a time with the true followers of Christ. And the semblance of Christianity is calculated to deceive many. But in the harvest of the world, there will be no likeness between good and evil. Then those who have joined the church, ha, I love this. Then those who have joined the church, but who have not joined Christ will be manifest. Ha, there are some folk who have joined the church. But they have not joined Christ. The tears are permitted to grow among the wheat, to have all the advantage of sun and shower. But the, in the time of harvest, he shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not, Malachi 3.18. Christ himself will decide who are worthy to dwell with the family of heaven. He will judge every man according to his words and his works. Christ is going to judge you. That's why, you know, you find people, they, they, they like to slip around in a no-tell motel, thinking they can hide their sin from the rest of the church, and they hide and do their stuff in secret, but you don't realize that what is, you might be able to avoid the eyes of men, you cannot avoid the eyes of God. And here's what you do. When you hide from your sin from men, knowing God can see it, you literally elevate men above God because you're more worried about men seeing your sin than God seeing it because you must know God can see it. The last line on this is very powerful. Christ Object, let's page 74. Ellen White says this. Profession is as nothing in the scale. It is character that decides destiny. And unfortunately, church, there are many believers who think that just because they profess being Christians, it's enough. Once saved, I'm always saved. 
Your folks who say, no, Jesus loves us too much to ever rebuke us. Let me tell you something. It is not just justification. It is justification, sanctification, and then we are we experience glorification. God expects that we are obedient and that we grow in him and in his grace. That's why Jesus doesn't just say, confess your sins. He says, repent and be baptized. The Greek word for repentance means to have a different mind afterwards, meaning that you have a character transformation as you grow in Christ. As he says, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Be not transformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can't be a Christian and stay exactly the same. That's what tear do. They never bear fruit. So anybody preaching that you can come into the church and live the way you used to live and nothing needs to change, they are preaching a doctrine of devils. God has called you to change, to be more like Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 speaks to it clearly. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I become quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. When does Jesus utter the words of Revelation 22, 11? It is when Daniel says that Michael stands up. It is when Jesus leaves the work of the priest in the most holy place in the sanctuary in heaven, and he puts on his kingly robe. When he does that, whatever the condition of everyone on the world is, it's over. That's the way it's going to be. He then gathers his angels and returns to earth to, re to, re to redeem and rescue his people. And at that point, that's why he says in verse 12, behold, I come quickly. And his reward is with him. It speaks to the investigative judgment that we believe is Adventist because Jesus makes the judgment before he, can, he can't give a reward and don't get, make a judgment. His reward is with him because he's already decided on behalf of the saints. Second huh. Timothy chapter four and verse six says this. For I am now ready to be offered. This is Paul as he's about to go and be put to death by Nero. The emperor of Rome, the wicked emperor of pagan Rome. Second Timothy chapter four and verse six, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Look what Paul says. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He didn't say, listen, I, I accepted Jesus and that was it. He fought a good fight. He fought his whole life. He finished the course. He grew in grace and in Christ. His character was transformed. The Paul at the, in 2 Timothy is not the Paul you find in Acts persecuting the Christians and holding the coats for those who would stone Stephen. He's changed. He says, I've kept the faith. I like what he says here. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul is referencing again the fact that during the time between the close of probation and the, re and the return of Christ, there will be a difficult time, and we will love his appearing. We'll be hoping for his appearing. We'll be praying for his appearing, crying out in Jacob's trouble. Paul says, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. It's sitting there waiting. And when the angels begin to return, they're going to collect those crowns and take them with them. And what is Jesus? He's a righteous judge. He'll give it to me that day. Why? Because the righteous judge has already done the investigative judgment. The crown has Paul's name on it. And here's where it gets real deep, church. And who you think is wheat and who you think is tear. Because Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11 makes this whole crown thing even clearer. Revelation 3, 11 says, behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown. Did you get it? In other words, there's a crown waiting for you, brother and sister. There's a crown waiting for you. And Jesus is one day going to stand up and declare it's over. If you're filthy, you're going to stay filthy. If you're holy, you're going to stay holy. And he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And, and, and he's on his way back. And Paul says, listen, I'm, I'm ready. I, it's done. Paul has been sealed. I'm waiting for my crown along with all those, especially during that time of trouble, who will be waiting and anxious for the return of Christ. 
John the Revelator, Jesus speaking. But John the Revelator writes it. Jesus warns again, I'm coming quickly. After probation closes, I'm coming quickly. But he says to us today, hold fast what you have. Paul said, I have kept the faith. Don't become a tear. Paul makes it clear that you are not one saved, always saved. Because one, there's a crown laid up for you. But in Revelation 3 and verse 11 at the end, it says, be careful that another man takes your crown. And that could mean another man takes your crown and it's given to the other man. Or because you will let people get under your skin or teach you false doctrine that you lose the crown that's supposed to be yours. Either way, a crown can be lost. Church wheat bear fruit. Fruit represents character. Ephesians 6 tells us that. And I'm challenging you today. In the prophetic scheme of things, where we are in time, that we must make sure now that we are holding fast what we have. Not, there's not a message for you to try and figure out who the tear is in church. The question is, are you a wheat or are you tear? Are you a deceptive, intoxicating member of the church, always leading people away from God? Or are you the wheat bearing the fruit that nourishes and keeps the church of God strong? Challenge you. Call on the name of God out of humility. Humble yourself. And accept the Lord Jesus Christ fully. Because we serve a God who's coming for wheat. And here's the beautiful thing. He can make us wheat that bears fruit. He and he only. Submit to him and accept that. God will prepare you for what is about to come. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study the parable of the wheat and the tear in the context of prophecy. Father God, I, I love your word and the clarity that exists therein. Help us now, Lord, to be prepared for what is coming upon the earth, that we would not be moved or easily afraid. Bless us to this end, we pray, sweet Jesus. Help us to be ready for your soon return. Amen.